This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. The stories we tell ourselves form the narrative that shapes our lives. A great portion of the Jewish tradition comes from the telling and retelling of stories from generation to generation. In this week's episode of Up Close, we look at these foundational stories from several different perspectives. Now, the foundational text that forms someone's life can be anything. It can be the Bible, it can be a great work of literature, it could be children's books. And we'll speak with authors who come from each of those areas. New Yorker staff writer Rebecca Mead found her main story in one of the most famous novels in the English language, George Eliot's Middlemarch. Her book is My Life in Middlemarch. Michael Coogan is a professor at Harvard University's Divinity School and has been writing about and teaching the Old Testament for decades. His book, The Old Testament, a historical and literary introduction to the Hebrew Scriptures, is one of the primary textbooks that university students use to access the Bible. And when it comes to accessing literature for the first time, the children's books of the late Maurice Sendak are almost universally known in the English-speaking world. Justin Schiller and Leonard Marcus discuss their book, Maurice Sendak, a celebration of the artist and his work. First, here's Rebecca Mead discussing her life in George Eliot's Middlemarch. Rebecca, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So your book is an exploration of what happens when we and I think this speaks a lot to the, the, what we talk about as the Jewish experience, the idea that what happens when we revisit a text over and over and we keep going back to these, the foundational stories that made us who we are and we tell them in different ways. Yeah, well, my book is about my reading of the great English novel, Middlemarch, that I first read when I was 17 and have read roughly every five years since then. So I'm now 47, so you can do the math. Um, but, uh, so you how know, many years uh, have you spent <laughs> reading Middlemarch? I was, well, it's been yeah. you know it's been this it's been a long time. I mean you know yeah. it's it's and every time I go back to it, it has something new to tell me about where I am in my life and who I'm surrounded by, and it in, it, it informs what I think about what I do. And what was it like for you to now I mean, you're basically going endeavoring in a project where some thirty years after your first encountering the book digging really deeply into not only the book but the author and trying to figure out why do why did the the text end up the way it did and how do, and how if at all do i think differently about the text now that i'm revisiting it yeah. through the author's lens yeah well what i wanted to do was to go back and look very closely at middlemarch itself at the writing of it, what George Eliot was inspired by, who she was talking to, where she was going, who she was seeing, and to think about the ways that that might have informed the writing of the story. And then also just to look closely at the story itself and the characters and to try to understand how my evolving relationship with them had changed. You know, when I was young, I identified with the heroine of the story who is Dorothea Brooke, this young noblewoman, a gentlewoman who's um, beginning uh, uh, her life and yearning to have a more significant existence. And I was growing up in a provincial English town and yearning to have a more significant existence. You know, and as I've grown older, I see my different characters come into focus, different storylines matter more. Um, and it's sort of the measure of a great book is that you can go back to it again and again, and every time you go to it, it has something new to tell you. And you talk about George Eliot in her fiction and perhaps more broadly, trying to trying to explore these similar ideas, trying to figure out what do we really, what does she really think about people? What does she really think about the world? What does she think about religion and faith mm -hmm. and so forth? Uh, both in the sense that Middlemarch was a serial itself, but also throughout career and fiction. Well, she she began her life. Uh, in the you know in the church and and quite devout and in her teenage years she became very devoutly religious and very committed and then she lost her faith in her 20s when she fell in with a group of sort of free thinking people um, and she she sort of read all the literature to try to convince them that yes there was a god and ended up thinking that there wasn't and so she although she had the kind of residual moral um, convictions that her faith had given her. So she spent most of her life writing and thinking about how to be good in the absence of God. Um, and this is a you know, huge preoccupation in Middlemarch. It's a very moral book without being, I think, a didactic one. Right. And your universe, I think, is is interesting in light of the, the narrative flow of Middlemarch, obviously probably why you, you decided to embark upon this project. The idea that you say you grew up in a family that it's not that you 
grew up in an illiterate family, you grew up in a family where books were not a central focus and literature was not a central focus. And that you came into Middlemarch and you came into to literature uh, mostly for going to college yeah. and, you be, and you fell in love with it and you became a writer and you, be, and you went to Oxford and you became a writer at the New Yorker and so forth. Um, and, and it's interesting to me how that parallels with, with, with a broad idea of, of, of civilization as you know, something is it's when we can explore stories and how that can, how that can change the course of things. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I grew up in a, in a home where my parents were, they, they read, they read quite a bit, but neither of them had gone to school past the age of 15 or 16. They hadn't had the opportunity and they hadn't had any of the opportunities that I had um, and were able to give them to me and to my brother. Um, which is something that you don't realize at the time you need to be grateful for, but you need to be really grateful for it. Um, and so there is that, there was that opportunity, you know, and in moving to New York to make myself into a New Yorker, which is something that one can do and that I think I've done. Um, and, and, you know, taking on a new culture and a new home and a new identity in a way. Um, it's a very, it, the, my book is, is what I didn't realize when I was writing it or when I con first conceived of it but I now see that it's in some ways a book about what home is, you know, where you come from and where you make your home and what your relation to your first home is. And now the Old Testament with Harvard University professor Michael Coogan. Michael Coogan, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, you've done a great amount of teaching around the, the Old Testament and this is the third edition of your work that is meant for, mostly for college students uh, on the Old Testament. That's right. So for the average person, you've had a, a great amount of experience introducing people to different concepts of the Bible. For the average person who is in our audience, who grew up Jewish and probably has some idea of what they do know about the Bible, about the Old Testament, what don't they know about the Old Testament? Well, I, d I don't know exactly what your average person knows or doesn't know, but I would say many people still think of the Bible as something that was sort of handed down from heaven by God, either shrink-wrapped or loaded onto a Kindle or something like that. And in fact, the Bible isn't one single book. It's more like an anthology of writings from many different periods, many different writers written over the course of more than a thousand years. Right, well, even according to its own terms, it's not really a book, it's a great many books. And, right. and, and, and approaching it, approaching various of those books in their context is a lot of what, what you're teaching. Yeah, that's right, and I'm glad to use the word context because I think because these are very ancient texts, in order to understand what they mean for us today in all sorts of ways, we have to first try to understand what they meant when they were originally written. And that means trying to understand their context, their historical contexts, their literary contexts, um, the languages that were used and so forth. So context is very important. But interpretation of the Bible has gone through lots of different stages. That's right. And so how, how do you address some of that development? Well, the interpretation of the Bible begins in the Bible itself, actually. Um, the book of Deuteronomy, for example, Devarim, is a kind of commentary on older laws found in Exodus and Leviticus. Uh, so Deuteronomy invites us and even requires us to uh, become interpreters. And that's, in a sense, what Moses is doing in the, um, <clears throat> in the framework of Deuteronomy. He's interpreting the law that they have already received. So the Bible needs interpreting, and that interpretation has been going on ever since. One of the most, I think, important changes that occurred was beginning in the 17th century when scholars began to think of the Bible not as a, primarily as a book authored by God or dictated by God to certain select individuals, but to look at it the way they would look at any other sort of literature, to look at it without, um, critically without any sort of presuppositions. And that has become standard among biblical scholars, except for the most conservative Jewish and Christian scholars um, in, in the modern era. And, and how does some of the, the ignorance of the Bible, how do you think some of that uh, creates, uh, creates effects uh, in society? And how, how do you think some of the, the assumptions about the Bible that are out there that are just popularly held, but even completely wrong, even on the Bible's own terms, how do you think that, that affects the discussion around it? Well, I think one of the most important things is that people have to read the Bible. There was a, there's 
so, some colleagues of mine have said there's a kind of appalling lack of biblical literacy. People think they know what the Bible says, but they haven't really read it carefully. And reading it, I think, is, is the most important thing to do. And one of the things I try to do in this book and other books I've written is to sort of make it possible for people to read the Bible with greater understanding and greater appreciation. So you've been teaching Bible for some <coughs> decades, and now you're currently a lecturer at Harvard Divinity School. What is your sense at this point of uh, why people are studying the Bible at the college and graduate level, and, uh, and what are they looking for? I think many people study the Bible for religious reasons. I think some for cultural reasons. I think they want to learn more about this book that they've heard about but never really opened. And what I try to do is to open it up for them and get them as excited as I have been learning f with it and from it for the last uh, several decades. And finally this week, we turn to Maury Sendak, a celebration of the artist and his work. Now, it's undeniable when reviewing Sendak's work, whether in the text or in the drawings, there's something of an edge there. There's something that's a little sharper, whether it's literally sharp teeth or whether it's an idea of, um, of, of rejecting societal norms or rejecting, uh, or, or rejecting the idea of simply just everybody being nice that we see in a lot of other books. What do you think made him or allowed him to bring that edge to his work? Um, well, I think the force of his talent um, gave him a certain amount of license. Um, he came along in the early 1950s at a time when children's books were, as you say, uh, very tame for the most part. Uh, but he was working with a great editor at Harper, a woman named Ursula Nordstrom, who his whole career was about um, stirring things up and changing um, the norm for children's books, being more honest with kids. And so he had a good champion, so that really helped him a lot in the early days. And then he worked like a demon. You know, he would illustrate seven or eight books a year. So he put himself out into the world so that he could not be ignored. Um, and with Where the Wild Things Are, which was probably about his 52nd or 54th book, um, he created a masterpiece, something that everyone, even the people who thought the Wild Thing characters were a little scary, had to acknowledge was, um, you know, perfectly formed. What do you think are some of the, some of the ideas uh, outside of his books or, or, the th or, or that he, sh he would share that you think are, are, that he, he would want more people to connect to? I think just the, uh, the, the trials and tribulations of, of being alive and learning to move forward not being confined and uh, uh, blocked by various obstacles. Do you feel, it's interesting you say, he paying so much attention to the trials and tribulations of life, do you feel like he was a happy person? Um, I knew Maurice for 45 years, and uh, what always struck me, he was happy when he was talking about um, his passion for, uh, for books, for art, um, but otherwise, uh, um, he enjoyed suffering. <laughs> uh, and and, and I, I say that uh, um, very respectfully. Um, he felt he couldn't do what he wanted to do with, without straining himself. To what degree do you think uh, th this, this, he was influenced in, in, a, in a Jewish way. To, yet, to what degree do you think his work spoke to a Jewish frame of mind? And, and also then, then later in life when a, a, lot of the, you know, a lot of the work that, he, that we think of his is from decades ago, how did he respond to, to, to Jewish ideas and Jewish notions? One thing is I think he's, he thought of children as outsiders. And I think that in a way was also how he thought of himself as a Jewish person in America. You know, so it kind of worked on different levels. Um, and when he portrayed children, this was one of the big th breakthroughs of his work. Right from the beginning, um, the early 50s, he didn't draw beautiful blonde children. He drew short, stumpy, dark-haired children who With some- Dazzly hair. Yeah, and some reviewers called them too European looking, which was a code word for maybe Jewish. <laughs> or like they're from New York. You know, yes. and his timing was somewhat fortunate in that People were, things were changing, beginning to change, at least in the 50s. You know, there was, there were publishers, 
a, public, a Jewish person could get a job in a publishing company, which wasn't true in the 20s in New York. Um, and there, you know, the attitudes were changing to some extent also. Um, so these dark little children were, were accepted much more so than they would have been 30 or 40 years ago. But it was certainly one of the ways that he expressed his Jewishness through his portrayal of, of childhood. Now, Justin, a, a lot of the, the, the work in this book talks about the influences on Sendak and, and, what, uh, and what made his work what it was. But as someone with a, with a broad scope uh, look at the children's book world in general, uh, what can you tell about what, what his influence was on the books that came after? Um, Mar Maurice was a, a very uh, a thorough and detailed uh, collector. And so he brought uh, into his own books, uh, as you say, the influence of Randolph Caldecott, Gustav Doré, um, um, all the people that he admired. Uh, for the influence that he brought and other people uh, have copied. Uh, I, th I think Leonard is probably in a better position of being a, uh, someone who has studied modern children's books. Yeah, well, I, I think many of the really well-known illustrators of the next generation, people like Chris Van Allsburg, for example, um, who won two um, Caldecott medals, there's a darkness um, as well as a, a, fantasy, a fantasy playfulness to his artwork. And Maurice really gave everyone who came after him permission to be dark, you know, he, because the, the, uh, the recognition that he achieved um, sort of set a different level for everyone else. That's all for this week's abbreviated web episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable or listen to the full audio as a podcast available on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. The Jewish channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and on Comcast in the on-demand menu under premium channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.